Welcome back to Anatomy on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. We discussed a bunch of different ligaments and the structure of the SI joint in the previous video. So remember we looked at an anterior view, saw all of these ligaments here, posterior view, and then we ended with this cross section. And I left you with a thought here. We've got this sacrum right here. Here's the right ilium, here's the left ilium. How the heck does the sacrum, with all the weight on top of it, just stay situated in these two SI joints? So here's an anterior view. I know we've got all these ligaments here, right? But consider how much weight the sacrum has to bear. All the lumbar vertebra, the thoracic vertebra, the cervical vertebra, the head, all the weight of the torso, the abdomen, the head, the neck, the arms, everything really is sitting on the sacrum. And there's nothing underneath the sacrum. There's nothing below it that's just holding the sacrum up. Literally, the, the right and left ilium right here are just holding it in place. So, for instance, if you do a high jump and you land, how the heck does the sacrum support that? How does it not just fall through? How do these ilia right here, left and right, just keep the sacrum in position? And that's a really important consideration because the surface area of the joint is really small. And these ligaments, yes, they're very strong, but by themselves, they would not be enough to keep the sacrum in place. The sacroiliac joints are small in area, but they are extremely stable joints. And remember, we have this phenomenon in anatomy where for joints, you usually sacrifice stability for mobility or mobility for stability. So the sacroiliac joints have a negligible mobility. They do move some, as we'll see in a few minutes, but their mobility really just should be considered almost zero. So these are an extremely stable set of joints. And this video is really going to be focusing on how they are that stable, especially when the sacrum has to bear all that weight and the size of the joint is really small. All right, so we're going to be talking about the stability of the SI joint. And in this picture right here, this is just a model, uh, a 3D model of the pelvis, it begs the question, how does that sacrum not just fall through? Because it looks like you have a vertical joint, right? How does the sacrum not just slip through there with all the weight that it has to bear? Well, first of all, as we mentioned, the SI joint mobility under normal circumstances is extremely limited. Normally, it's only about two degrees. If your shoulder joint had two degrees, it would, you wouldn't even notice two degrees. Two degrees is negligible. If you go on a goniometer and look at two degrees, you probably can't even detect two degrees. Okay? When you're looking at your shoulder joint, you can detect 90 degrees of movement. That's easy. Okay? Two degrees, you probably can't even detect that. So the mobility here is pretty much negligible in the SI joints. Okay? In fact, the only movements that really are even worth considering are most likely deformations and slight gliding motions in response to body weight and ground reaction forces. No significant movements occur here. It's all stability. So now, for the first reason that we have such a stable joint, we have what's called form closure and force closure. This right here is a little model here that they use to describe how the SI joint works. Okay? Now, the first mechanism that explains why the SI joint is so stable has to do with form closure and force closure. We're going to first look at form closure, which is basically the vertical support of the load. And we're going to look at this model here that's used to describe that. In this picture, the black box is the sacrum, and this is the right ilium, and this is the left ilium. Vertical load support here implies that each side of the ilium has a little bit of bone underneath the sacrum. Okay? And so you can see here that even though the sacrum is just sitting there, it won't fall through due to gravity because there's a little bit of ilium support underneath. Okay? There's not much, but there is a little bit. Form closure alone wouldn't be enough, so you also have to have force closure, horizontal support of the load directed internally. And so this right here is going to be the force closure. So here's the sacrum. Okay? And again, you have both sides of the ilium on either side, and there's mechanisms that force the ilium toward the midline. Okay? And so they're pushing inward, and by pushing inward, they create some friction there, so to speak, and it prevents the sacrum from falling through. And so if you combine the net effects of 
form closure and force closure, you get a situation that kind of looks like this. So even though the sacrum, due to gravity and everything above it actually, is directed downward, there's some vertical force applied by the ilium that prevent it from falling downward, and internal horizontal force that force it together and force that closure and prevent it from falling downwards. Okay, So those are the form and force closure effects of the ilium on the sacrum. And also, in terms of that force closure, you have a bunch of muscles that are arranged in a cross-bracing manner, and those muscles actually force the ilia closer together, which is actually what creates this effect where the force is directed internally, and that prevents the sacrum from falling downward. So the point is you have a bunch of forces here that are really forcing the ilia closer together and also some vertical support from ilia underneath the sacrum. In fact, you can kind of see that right here. You can see some of the ilium beneath this part of the sacrum, which is providing some of that vertical support. Okay, So that's the first reason why the SI joint is so stable. It has a self-locking mechanism. The next reason is, well, Legos. Now what the heck do Legos have to do with the SI joint? Well, let's think about this. We think about Legos, right? On one side they have these things sticking up, right? And we know intuitively on the bottom side they have little holes. And so I can put this blue Lego on its bottom, it has those holes. And theoretically those holes should really just kind of fit into these pegs on the red Lego, right? They should just stick in there like that. I think at some point we've all used Legos, and when they click, they just click in like that and they stick. It turns out that the articular surfaces of the SI joint, that is the sacrum and the ilium, have the same pattern. So here's the ilium, here's the surface of the sacrum, and actually this picture really doesn't even do it justice. I really couldn't find a very good one that was high resolution. But you can see here that the ilium surface is up and down, up and down, kind of like the Legos. And then the sacrum has a complementary fit. Okay, And again, this picture doesn't really do it justice. It actually underestimates the degree of that spiking in and out. Okay, But the point is, is when the sacrum sits in on the ilium, and those interlocking surfaces, which are complementary, sit next to each other, it makes it very difficult for the sacrum to drop through. Okay? If you took these Legos and turned them horizontally by 90 degrees, they wouldn't fall. They would stay connected because they kind of just click into one another. That's kind of the way the ilium and the sacrum fit together in the SI joint on either side. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And so this interlocking mechanism like this, and then this self-locking mechanism of form closure and force closure, these two things combined really create some massive stability of the SI joint. Okay? And you don't want a lot of movement here because if there were a lot of movement then you might actually dislocate the SI joint. There are other structures here that we're going to talk about that actually restrict further movement, but before we do that we need to talk about two uh, potential movements, nutation and counter nutation. Alright, here's really the more neutral appearance of the lumbar spine, the pelvis, and then here's of course the sacrum. Let's suppose we were to rotate the sacrum. We'd also have to get some rotation of the lumbar spine, but the point is if we take the superior surface of the sacrum and rotate it anteriorly, okay? That also means take the inferior surface of the sacrum and rotate it posteriorly. So imagine taking the sacrum and rotating it like these arrows show, that movement is nutation, and you'd get something like this. So right here, this is in the nutated state. Okay? Notice that, in addition to movements of the lumbar spine, the superior part of the sacrum has been rotated forward or anteriorly, and the inferior part of the sacrum and coccyx have been rotated posteriorly. We're now in the nutated state, and so from going to this position up here, down here, that is nutation. Okay? Now it turns out, that restriction of nutation is very important for stability of the SI joint. And the major structure that restricts nutation or sacral nutation is the sacrotuberous ligament. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, the sacrospinous ligament also assists with that. 
Uh, but again, the sacrotuberous ligament is the major structure that restricts sacral nutation. So we don't get anywhere near this degree of nutation. This is not a normal movement. If we obliterated the sacrotuberous ligament, we might get this, okay? But again, this movement is restricted via the sacrotuberous ligament. We can also further restrict that nutation range of motion also by the action of biceps femoris, and that's because it originates on the ischial tuberosity. Uh, so the biceps femoris, remember that's one of the hamstring muscles, the lateral one, that can also restrict nutation. Okay? Additionally, there is a little bit of sacral nutation, maybe about two degrees that occurs, but the amplitude of that sacral nutation, even within that range, can be controlled and modulated by coactivation of some of the pelvic floor muscles and the sacral multifidus. But the point is, generally what you would need to know here is what nutation is, and also that it's restricted mainly by the sacrotuberous ligament. Okay. Now for the opposite movement, counter nutation. So here we're in a nutated state down here, we need to get back to the neutral state, that movement is counter nutation, so it's the opposite. So we have initially our coccyx and inferior sacrum, they're already rotated out posteriorly, so they need to rotate in the opposite direction, they need to rotate back anteriorly. You can see they've done that up here. And then the superior part of the sacrum would need to be rotated back posteriorly. You can see that's happened here. And so when you go from the nutated state back to the neutral state, that is counter nutation. Okay? And in general, we can say that it's posterior tilt of the superior sacrum. So it tilts back posteriorly, gets back to its original position, but also the coccyx rotates anteriorly along with the inferior sacrum. Now, in terms of sacral counter nutation, uh, it's restricted mainly by the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament. Remember, this was one of the two ligaments that was part of the posterior sacroiliac ligament. Right here, this is the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament. Okay? That ligament actually restrains counternutation, and that ligament's actually shown right here. Remember that it actually connects the most posterior part of the iliac crest, really with the sacrum, and then also partially blends with this ligament right here, which is the sacrotuberous ligament. Okay? Remember that the sacrotuberous ligament, which is right here, restricts sacral nutation. Long dorsal sacroiliac ligament restrains sacral counternutation. And we can also get further restriction of counter nutation range of motion by coactivation of latissimus dorsi, actually, through its attachment at the thoracolumbar fascia. But the major things to know here would be what counter nutation is, and also the major ligament that restricts that range of motion, that is long dorsal sacroiliac ligament. And the main takeaways from this video are really just to understand what creates this massive stability of the SI joint, and really understanding that its mobility is extremely low. Mobility is about two degrees. You won't even be able to detect two degrees. Go on a goniometer and measure out two degrees. If you tried that motion, you may not even be able to detect that at all. Um, this is certainly a lot less than what we would expect, even for something like E version of the ankle, which already has a low range of motion, but certainly negligible compared to motion of the shoulder joint or the knee joint or the hip joint. You shouldn't even be able to detect this, okay? so. Very, 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 very stable, very, 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 very immobile. And you don't want this mobility because if it had mobility, you might get dislocations here. And along the same lines of, of these two slides, if you did have a disruption of the sacrotuberous ligament or the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament, you might actually uh, allow some extra mobility there. And that, in, that extra mobility can impair load transfer through the SI joint creating SI joint dysfunction. Hopefully this video made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.